The sound barrier was broken for the first time officially by Chuck Yeager. There have been many claims since then. Uh, some of those were possibly German pilots flying in the jets in World War II rocket planes. Most of them met um, met their fate in a hole in the ground. Uh, there was no reporting devices, there was no sensors. There was no way to, to judge if, in fact, they actually broke the sound barrier. There was just claims made. Also, in 1947, there's another claim that was actually here at this Air Force base. Uh, that was actually it was done by a um, North American test pilot named George Wheaties Welch. But once again, he did not have any recording devices of the aircraft, so there's no proof that he actually broke the sound barrier. Uh, the, but Jaeger was the first one to officially go through the sound barrier in uh, October 14, 1947. So post-World War II, we're really going into um, experimental aircraft. Again, we, we are in an explosion of growth. The NACA shows up here in the Far East. They're, they're doing all kinds of testing that has never been done before. Um, a lot of these parameters have yet to be established, and we are still losing pilots at an alarming rate. But with that, safety, though, is, is trying to keep up. We're, they're constantly developing new systems to keep pilots safe. But it was, it was an uncertain time, that's for sure. Um, and we're getting into a lot of different concepts like the flying wing concepts. Um, the X-1 comes out of obviously the post-World War II years, 1947. Um, there's just, a, again, a lot of different things that are going on. Bell XS-1 was initiated, the, the production of the aircraft was initiated by the Army Air Corps uh, or the Air Force. Uh, towards the end of World War II, they were already experimenting with the idea of trying to get an aircraft that would be the first to fly through the sound barrier. The British were also working on their own design. And uh, de Havilland Company was in fact uh, producing something called the de Havilland Swallow. The um, British actually made the first attempt at going supersonic, but the aircraft crashed and it took the life of Godfrey de Havilland Jr., who was a test pilot for the de Havilland Company. The, uh, the U.S. effort uh, was based around uh, the NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The NACA was conducting quite a bit of testing, uh, both in Florida and here, but the Air Force was a little impatient, and the Air Force wanted the airplane to go supersonic now. And so they took the program, after the NACA had it for a year or so, they took the program away from them, uh, NACA continued flying their own XS-1, but the Air Force had a modified version of it with a thinner wing. And that airplane was slated to go supersonic. That's what the whole project was about. Jaeger was the primary pilot, again, Bob Hoover the, the backup, but they also got support from the NACA, even on the Air Force side. And again, that is something that's not noted often in history books. The NACA, NACA was a big part of this. And of course, NACA eventually became NASA. But the testing continued here, and uh, Jaeger had conducted, I believe, eight flights before they decided to try for the sound barrier. The key to that was the flying tail, the horizontal stabilizer. Up until then, the aircraft had been built with a movable tail, but the primary flight controls was still a traditional elevator. The shock wave they discovered was covering the elevator, and therefore when they say there's no elevator ineffectiveness, there was no airflow back there, that's actually true. The shock wave was flying, was, was breaking before the elevator. The key was to get the tail to move. Now the aircraft had been designed with a moving tail, but you had it had locks involved in the, in the process. So you had to have the aircraft on the ground, you have to unlock the tail, you then adjust the angle you wanted it at, and then you had to relock the tail. You could not move it in flight. The engineers on this, particularly Jack Ridley, who was primary on this, uh, discovered this and realized that that may be the solution. Now, the British had also been working on the same idea, as had the Germans in World War II. So it wasn't 
just here. There were a lot of folks working on it, but we were the first ones to actually modify the XS1 and modify it with a moving tail, which could only move one or two degrees in either direction, up or down. But it was enough. And when they conducted the, um, the supersonic flight, uh, that's exactly what they did. They were able to move the tail in flight, get the aircraft through the uh, through the shock wave, and therefore through the sound barrier.